Welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional. Today, we're brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. What's the most critical aspect of your business? Is it the pet care, dog walks, is it your updates, photos, or is it your meet and greet, your onboarding process for new clients? These really do set the stage for what clients can and should expect from our business. And so we need to have a well thought out thorough process that is predictable and provides all the necessary information to both us and the client coming on board. To walk through what these processes can look like, today we are super excited to talk with Kelly Hester, owner of Kelly's Critters, about her journey into pet care, how she switched positions from a licensed customs broker turned pet sitter, and how and why she takes her meet and greets and onboarding process so seriously. Let's get started. Hi, Colin. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm the owner of Kelly's Critters Dog Walking and Pet Sitting, Kelly's Critters for short. I am an LLC. Um, We're in Wake Forest, North Carolina, which is a suburb just adjacent to Raleigh. And we service most of Wake Forest, a little bit of Raleigh, and a couple of other small towns nearby as well. Um, We currently have 11 staff members and... um, we're doing pretty well. Business is going well. Wake Forest is a great place to have a business like this. The weather is awesome, so we don't need to deal with the snow and ice. Um, also, there's a lot of uh, traveling here because we're two hours from the mountains and two hours from the beach, the ocean. So people like to get out of town a lot. And most everybody in this area are transplants, so their families are not here, and so they're often visiting their families as well. And they don't have people to care for their pets because their families aren't here. (laughs) Uh, That's a lot that you just dove into about your service area, Kelly. How how did you start learning about your service area? I mean, are you from that particular area, Uh, you know, or, or is this stuff that you've just kind of picked up as you've been running your business? Well, I'm actually from Chicago, and um, I've been here now for 12 years, and my business is, this is my sixth year in business. I kind of just picked it up as I went along. I actually, um, when I first started this, um, I had been laid off from my corporate job, and I spent months trying to find um, a job, and I really wanted to get out of my very stressful field. So... um, my daughter suggested, why don't you get a side gig? I'm like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so she explained it to me. And um, I ended up um, dog walking for another company and I really loved it. Hmm. But there just wasn't enough enough of it for, for me to really um, be lucrative. So I was like, what if I try to do this on my own? And it was kind of just an experiment and it took off pretty rapidly. I actually got a book and read, read, read and found out about Facebook groups and read, read, read on Facebook and learned, learned so much. And I continue to learn. As far as learning about our our particular markets, I think that's something that many of us might not do or give a whole lot of second thought to because we you know, we've been there for so long, or it's where we were born and raised, or we're, we we feel like we are personally familiar with the area. But really, trying to understand what makes that market tick, right? What is driving this? Where is the economy? functioning? Where are people working? Why are people traveling? Like Those are all things that impact our businesses directly. And as a business owner, if you can't really get your hands on that, it, it's kind of hard to get, a, you know, to, to, to run the kind of businesses that we do. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. This is just like I mentioned, this is a really great place to be for pet sitters. Yeah. Well, Kelly, you mentioned that you uh, have a career from from a corporate jobby job. Um, what what was that? And, and how do you feel like that impacts how you run your business? Well, I was a licensed customs broker. And what that is, is it deals with imports. It's a liaison between U.S. Customs and the importer. So basically business to business. Um, it was very high stress field and um, it impacts my business because I know the workings um, of an office and customer service and um, record keeping, um, stress levels and problem solving. You know, I dealt with that my whole career, my whole life. So I think it, um, it was very helpful 
you know, to know how to basically run an office. Yeah. Well, and you said that, that word, there's a couple words, record keeping, like just, I can't even imagine how critical that was as a customs broker of being able to keep and maintain that uninterrupted paper trail from one thing to another. And as, as business owners, record keeping comes in the form of client requests, right? Booking requests, uh, staff issues. Uh, if you're managing them, there are all these different aspects where we have to, we have to keep track of those somehow so that we have recourse or, you know, it is very, honestly, it's very satisfying as a business owner to have a client say, I never said that. And you send them the screenshot and you say, actually, here it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, back in the, in the customs broker days, we had a saying, CYA, always CYA, cover your ass. I don't know <laughs> if I can say that, but uh, so, you know, that was just something we knew to do because you just always had to have a trail. And that's something that was important in my business as well. Just as you said, if somebody comes back and says, well, I never said that, or, you know, I didn't book those dates or whatever, you know, <laughs> so it's like, well, yeah, you did, you know, yeah. but of course you, the customer is always right. And you have to handle that with kid gloves. You know, you certainly don't want to make a customer feel bad because they made a mistake, but you do have to cover your butt. Yeah. And I think many of us think of record keeping when it comes to incidents, right? Incident reporting of like, okay, I'm going to take a photo of the broken vase and I'm going to take a photo of the cleaned up vase. Or I'm going to take a photo of the diarrhea and then a photo of the cleanup diarrhea. But but really just thinking of it as more holistically going, you no, know, everything, like every interaction. And I, uh, in my early science career as a master's student, my graduate teacher handed me a field book. To, I was going to be writing data and information down in and hand it to me. And he said, this can and probably will be used against you in a court of law, write accordingly. Because we were dealing with endangered species. And, and basically it was, this will both protect you and it can bury you if you don't, you know, don't do this well. And that's something that has stuck with me of the importance of having that information somewhere in your in, in your business and just you as a person. Kelly, when you first started, you know, where did you start looking for clients and, and how did you start kind of those early days on? Um, mostly next door and talking to anybody I could. When we went out, uh, I would give business cards to everybody I, left, I met. Um, I would try to talk to other people, people that I didn't even know, like if we were at a restaurant or something and give them business cards. Um, sometimes I would leave a few business cards in a bathroom, you know, of a bar or restaurant and hopes, um, <clears throat> in the very early days, I didn't do it often. And I felt guilty for the longest time for not doing it more, but I used to actually take business cards and tape them to people's mailboxes. Like, um, actually walk the neighborhood and tape them to people's mailboxes. And, um, it was time consuming, but I mean, I had a lot of time in those days because I didn't have a lot of customers, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, next door. And then I, you know, learned more about Facebook and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So where, where do you feel like you're getting most of your clients these days? Google. Google. Okay. Definitely Google. When did that come into the mix? Um, and kind of how are you using that? Because Google is really, I know it's really powerful. And many people think that they you know, can't have one because they're not a physical location or how to get it set up and everything. Um, I think I was, I, I can't recall, but I was in business for a while before I got uh, my Google business page. The first thing I did was get my um, Facebook page up and running. Hmm. and uh, my business Facebook. And eventually I did get Google up and going. Yeah. I mean, it's just people are, you know, Googling, you know, pet sitters near me or whatever. And I'm ranking in the top five on Google. So that's, you know, very helpful. I really don't spend any time on next door anymore because hmm. next door, I find that uh, a lot of people are looking for the teenagers or very, uh, you know, inexpensive services. And they're not always looking. I mean, I do get some next door people and I used to get a lot when the business was new and my rates were low too, you know, um, you know, but I don't get much from next door anymore. So I don't really um, spend any time on next door. I used to peruse it all the time, you know, just like scroll until I found somebody looking for a pet sitter, you know, and once in a while, just, you know, post something about my business but I really don't take the time for that anymore. Well, there's just so many 
trade-offs there. And that's what I hear when you're talking about, Kelly. In the beginning, you had all this time, but few clients. So you could do the time-intensive boots-on-the-ground techniques that now it's probably really hard to find a full day or two to go canvas a neighborhood. And then when you look at client acquisition going, well, this one's really easy, it's really free, it's really cheap, and, and I'm, I'm, being, I'm connecting with this audience, but now it's, it's still harder to dive back in that. And then the client payoff isn't there for you to get that, you know, that, that ROI that you need for that person. So looking at different avenues as a business, as you grow too. You know, and I've done what most pet sitters do in the beginning is go and talk to the veterinarians and groomers and I've done a little bit about that uh, with that, but n- not that much. And I keep telling myself, I need to go do that. I need to do that, you know, but I'm finding too that um, some of the veterinarians, they don't want to recommend a pet sitter because they don't want to be held liable, you mm-hmm. know, if something happens, you know, and most of the um, the veterinarians now are corporate run, you know, there's very few mom and pop vets anymore. and um, you know, I have a a groomer, there's a few groomers, several groomers here, but there is one groomer that is recommending me quite often. So I'll go visit him every once in a while with some fancy donuts or something like that, you know, as a thank you (laughs) and keep me top of mind, you know, so. Yes. Yeah. uh, Yeah. We do the donut drops every now and then as well. And it, it, you know, it's kind of nice. You go in and and you buy, if you have three or four that you're going to go visit, you know, buying three dozen or four dozen donuts. And sometimes if you catch the donut shops at the end, they'll give you a deal because they just want to close up and leave. So I've had that happen before too. So it's kind of, you know, kind of helping everybody through that but it 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 is about making those right connections and one thing that i've we've worked on is not just stopping by one time right like you're saying it's going and saying hey i'm here this is what i do okay bye because it's not just that they sometimes just won't refer you but they don't know to for what to refer you right why why you what what do you do for the longest time we had somebody mm-hmm. who kept on referring to us for a service that we just didn't offer and it was really frustrating. And so we had to keep coming back and doing some more education and more education about who we were and, and what exactly we did so that they you know, kind of made that connection and could send the right clients to us. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Dan from NYC Pooch has this to say. Time to Pet has been a total game changer for us. It's helped us streamline many aspects of our operation, from scheduling and communication to billing and customer management. Uh, we actually tested other pet sitting softwares in the past, but these other solutions were clunky and riddled with problems. Everything in Time to Pet has been so well thought out. It's intuitive, feature rich, and it's always improving. If you're looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. What is the mission of Kelly's Critters? <clears throat> well, to offer peace of mind and respect for their personal property, um, you know, to treat everybody with kindness and respect. That pe- that peace of mind and respect. I mean, that's that respect word, that R word there is a lot of people don't think about that, right? Especially as respect from one person to another or respecting their property. But that's a huge aspect of what we do. It's not just peace of mind so that they don't have to worry. But part of that is knowing that we're going to respect the things that they do. So we, when you say respect their property, respect the person, how does that play out in the services that you offer? Well, you know, something as simple as when you walk into a customer's house, wipe your feet. And if your shoes are a mess, take them off, you know, um, don't just set your keys down on a wooden surface. Um, respect the, the pets that don't want you to come up to them right away that need, you know, need their space. Mm. Um, you know, be kind to, um, employees, you know, even the couple of times I've had to let somebody go. I want to do that with respect and kindness you know, so that they still feel like a valuable person and felt like the experience was decent. It wasn't horrible. Well, and that's, you mentioned you have have employees. How are you getting them on board with that mission? How are you connecting them to that? I hear that a lot of oh, connect them to the mission, vision, and values, connect them, make sure that they know that. How, how are you finding that you're able to take a new employee and help them see what the mission is and find some connection to it? Well, during orientation, we talk about that, you know, 
all sorts of our different policies and and stuff. You know, we talk about the shoes, you know, taking them off. Um, we talk about, um, you know, leaving the bathroom the way you found it. Was the seat up? Was the seat down? Was the door open? Was the door closed? You know, um, of course, we talk about kindness to pets. And, you know, that you're never going to be screaming or yelling or God forbid hitting any pets. You know, we we talk about all of that um, during our orientation. And also we treat them with respect and kindness. So, you know, it all comes back because they're being respected whenever they're dealing with me or one of my two admins. And that can that may feel a little overwhelming to somebody with staff going, I have to I have to tell them all of the million different ways it means to respect, right? I have to tell them to take off their shoes. I have to tell them to leave the bathroom. I have to tell them. And and I'm sure you don't do that. You don't spend seven days just going through all the different things that would be nice to do for a client, but you give some really good examples, right? And I think that's what that, that's this teaching moment of you're starting to connect them over. Here's this word respect. Here are a couple big examples that mean a lot. And, and, and staff over time start to, to now interpret that and kind of fill in the gaps. And now they're wiping down surfaces or they're setting things aside or doing these little nicety things that are respectful to the client in their property. Correct. And we, you know, we go over that too about, you know, leave, you know, we're not housekeepers, um, but we're going to leave the, we're going to clean up after ourselves and the pets. Yeah. You know, um, if we use any dishes, we're going to wash them and we're going to put them away. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I we, we had some 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 hires who initially were very hesitant about the dishwashing thing. That was something that they were a little confused as to why we, the pet sitters, would be washing dishes. And it was just very simple going, Well, did you use it? Right? Did would you want to would you want to come home to a pile of dirty uh forks that somebody had used for a week uh and, and clean them yourselves? If not, then that's what you know. That's why we clean this to make that a nice experience because that is a respectful thing to do to that person. If you use it, you replace it or clean it. And then the second part of that too, Kelly, that you mentioned was the importance of setting the example of we can tell people what we what the expectations are at all times, but now we have to also model that for people, and that's that's really hard uh, for 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 people who aren't used to having others look at them look to them for that example of oh how how do i communicate well i have to I have to look to the boss oh that's me oh gosh uh okay <laughs> <laughs> well the customer service aspect of it comes pretty naturally to me because i've been in corporate america you know for decades you know mm-hmm. and um so you know uh I know how to be nice to people and how to say things and, you know, read and reread something I'm sending, you know, to make sure that it's not, uh, you know, offensive in any way, but still can get your point across, you know, be nice, you know, just be nice. You know, read and reread that that's a big aspect of not hitting send immediately, not even saying the first thing that comes to your mind, uh, <laughs> right? It's very hard. <laughs> it's very, it's very frustrating, but knowing it's not just like I'm interacting with the staff member and I'm setting the example for them of how we're going to handle these interactions because maybe at a later date, this may come up again and, and the tables are switched and I want them to know what the expectations are. Or maybe it's a client with some issues that they're having um, or some troubles that they have or some concerns that they have and going, you know, I, I, I need to be, I'm not trying to censor myself in my speech. I'm trying to be careful and make sure that my, the words that I say are actually convey the meaning that I need them to. Cause that's where a lot of those problems come in where you shoot off a quick email and somebody responds and you go, that's not what I meant at all. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, but you use uh, staff to do things like meet and greets with your company. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I have two main meet and greet people um, who I've trained to do that. And my supervisor, the the girl who does the supervising for me, and and she also does a lot of admin work, she'll occasionally step in and do meet and greets. So how do you how do you train uh, staff members to do those? Because that's a that's a really weighty task. That's a, a you're, they're representing the company. They have to be equipped to answer all sorts of questions and guide people through a process. How did you go about selecting those people and training them to get them to that point? Um, well, selecting them because they're darn good 
pet sitters and they understand the business. They like the business. They've been here for a while. Um, <clears throat> they have good communication skills. They're, they're polite and they're intelligent. Um, we have a pretty thorough intake form and, um, what I did, so that guides them through all the questions, all the information we need to get from the customer. Mm -hmm. I took each of them separately because one person was trained to do meet and greets. And it was sometime later that I trained the second person. And what I did was I took her with me four times with on meet and greets. The first two I led and she just was there present. And then the second two, she led with me present. Hmm. And so um, it's pretty easy process, especially with the intake form. So um, I, of course, asked them, do you feel comfortable with this now? Do you feel that you can go do this without me? And they said they were ready. And um, I never looked back. They're doing they're doing great. And it's um, I love meeting people, but it's so nice not to have that responsibility anymore. Yeah, well, it makes it a lot more flexible too. When for the client, it makes it more accessible for the client, right? Because if if you're only one person doing meet and greets, and the client can only meet in the morning, but that's when you have visits, or that's when you've got something else scheduled, you can go, "Hey, we still have you covered," right? It's it's a it's it's kind of nice to just be able to be available a lot more for your clients when they need you. Definitely, and we just work it into our sitter's schedule. We actually put that put it on as a visit on yeah. the sitter's schedule, so there's no chance of her forgetting that she had a meet and greet because it's just there with all her pet sits, you know, it's on the schedule. And that, that form sounds really important too. I know when I first started doing meet and greets very early on, it was kind of just shucking and jiving, come up with questions on the spot and kind of asking for generic information and then maybe writing it down later and hoped I remembered. But, oh. <laughs> which, <laughs> I would which never was, trust myself with that. <laughs> no, it did not last very long. I will tell you that. And, and now we too have this massive intake form that clients say, do I have to fill all of this out? And we say, yes, please do. <laughs> and then we comb through it and we ask additional questions and stuff like that based off of it. But, you know, coming up with that form i'm sure that, that was just a, a huge help right, to being able to offload this kind of this kind of uh, uh, task well it, it's actually the same form that i used for myself that i started with you know in the beginning oh. of my pet sitting business and um you know it through the years there's been additional questions that have been added um you know to the form and um we actually what we do is well, once the initial contact with the customer, we do a phone call after they've reached out either by phone or email or our intake form on our website, we then do a, a phone call and we get all the initial information. What, how many pets, you know, what's the name of each dog? How old are they? What color are they? Are they friendly? Um, of course, the address, the phone number, the email. You know, so we'll get some initial stuff on the phone. And that gives us, too, a little bit of um, the customer gets a, a touch of the like, know, and trust because we've mm. actually had a phone conversation with them. And then we set up the meet and greet for them. And then um, we send them an invite to our software where they can go in and complete all their information, which they are supposed to do before the meet and greet. Um, and they, um, we also get, send them a welcome email, which will also, you know, go over the things about our company that we talked about on the phone, give them the the price of the visits they're asking about, instructions for keys, all of that. And um, my whoever is doing the meet and greet and my on my team will look at all the information that they entered in the system and put that on the intake form. So when they go to the customer's house, it's basically an interview. Um, we're finding out more information on how to care for the pets, finding out where everything is in the home. And it's also giving the customer a chance to interview us as well, you know? Um, and then there's some documents that they need to sign. We're not doing everything online. Like some businesses are where they can sign everything online and well, they, they do do that, but we also have an actual form that they sign. Um, and we want more of a, a little bit of a personal touch so that they can feel safe with us. Mm. You know, that's that process, Kelly, sounds, has it always been, worked like that as far as the multiple steps that you've had? Or how did you develop and get to that point for having the phone call, then the meet and greet? Like that's, 
because many people struggle with how to orchestrate this of when do I ask for what information and can I just have them all do it online or how do I do this all in person or what? So how did you come to this kind of this mix of a few of those? Well, it was always a phone call, you know, from day one, it was always a phone call. That's how the customers would reach me. Hmm. You know, if they emailed me because they saw my email address on a business card, let's say, you know, I would still need a phone call because I need to get the address. I need to find out more information about the pets. And, you know, is it even a job that we can do for you? You know, are you in our service area? You know, <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff, you know. So um, it's always been a phone call, always. And I don't, there's two schools of thought. I personally don't want people going into my system, um, which I use PPC. Unless I've invited them, I mm. because I don't want junk in there. If you're not a you know if you're not a customer because you're in our not in our service area, or you have an aggressive animal, you know we're not going to take that on. Um, I only want people in there that are in my system that are true customers. So they have to be invited to come in, into the system and create their profiles. Well, and then the other aspect of that too is it sounds like you know you're you're gathering information for these phone calls, and then you're going and putting that information into the client's profile for them, right? And obviously, they have to fill out some additional information before the meet and greet. But you're you're kind of you know, you're you're also adding to it for them. A little well, bit. we're basically opening their account, okay, and then sending them an invitation. So there's only the bare minimum in there, you know, the address, the phone number, the contact information. Each pet has their own little profile. We've entered the pet's name. You know, we don't get a lot of information on the pets. We'll get the breed, the color, the weight, um, you know, their disposition. And that's all we're putting in there. And then the customer is responsible for filling out everything else, where everything's located, how much you feed them, when you feed them, you know, uh, any special instructions, all of that. Okay. Uh, do you ever get any feet, uh, pushback from clients who don't want to enter all that information themselves? Not generally. No, no. I mean, I do have some older clients who just can't seem to get the visit requests, you know, going in and, you know, requesting their visits on the actual software. So there's only a couple that are like that. And we'll gladly put those in for them, you know, put their visits in. They'll contact us usually by email and tell us what they want and we'll put them in. Mm, yeah. But generally the customers are requesting their own visits in the portal, which really uh, is so wonderful compared to how I used to do things. <laughs> 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 Didn't have people requesting their own visits. And, you know, so I would put in all of that. And, you know, as we got bigger and bigger and bigger, that, you know, that becomes quite a chore. So it's just wonderful having the customers put it in. Yeah, because it gets back to that record keeping of, okay, like the client asked for this time, right? Or the client wanted it this way. So in some instance, we're following their directions and and, and their their wants. And we can reach out if we have questions. Like with, with this just came to us one uh, recently. We had a client who normally books always at like 8 a.m. And then one day they booked, you know, the earliest visit they had during the day was at 11. And we were like... Well, that's weird. Like that's mm -hmm. that's off. So we'll reach out in those instances and just double check, make sure everything's okay. But then, by and large, you're going okay. This is now. There's now. It's not now. The error is not on me, right? And I can I can reach out if I have questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We get some of that as well, and we'll just send them a message. Um, we very rarely call because you know the paper trail is nice when it's you know email or a message through the software to the customer. Um, you know, so we do have a paper trail and, you know, again, if they screw up that email, we have proof, you know, well, we questioned you and you said this and that's what we did, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, once in a while we might have to reach out by phone, but generally it's a message. For listeners who are sitting here wanting to have staff start doing meet and greets, what are some recommendations that you would give to them how to you know look at their existing staff pool or to try and hire somebody specifically for that? Well, first of all, the person has to have some confidence. Um, you know, occasionally we'll have people who come to work for Kelly's Critters and they're shy. You know, they're they're kind of shy. And I don't feel personally that that's the kind of person who's going to be successful doing meet and greets. And they probably wouldn't want to. Um, so it's somebody, for me, it's somebody who already knows the workings of the company. So they've already been working here. And they understand, you know, how to do pet sitting visits. 
and they understand the kinds of information that they need to know. They understand how to read the notes in the system, you know, and work with the app. So they know the kinds of information that needs to be gathered. Um, I think um, confidence and somebody who's pretty sharp, you know, on the intelligence level, you know, I mean, they don't have to be, you know, brain surgeons, but they've got to be able to think on their feet a little bit. Yeah, because you don't know what's going to you're going to you're going to come at you with a lot of meet and greets sometimes, right? But also trying to put together pieces of information because that's another key aspect of the meet and greet too, of not just reading the information, but also then listening to the person and looking at the at the area around you and start going, do these match up or like what is going on with this? Why do they keep referencing this? Like, it does take a little bit of going, okay, you're gonna have to put together a puzzle kind of in the moment with these things. <laughs> well, sometimes, usually they're pretty straightforward, but there right. are sometimes, you know, and I also want my pet sitter, my um meet and greet staff who are pet sitters, you know, I also want them to be looking, you know, is this is this dog's personality going to be okay? Is this dog going to let us in the house when mom and dad aren't home? Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got to be looking at that too. Um, you know, occasionally we'll run into a, a hoarder situation or something like that. Uh, and it's like, well, can we do these visits? You know, is this something that we can safely do? Can we safely send a team member into this home? You know, and then yes, usually. But sometimes we'll mark the account. We we do overnight service, but we'll mark the account no overnights, you okay. know, because we wouldn't want to put our staff in a place that was unpleasant. Sure. It, 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 there's a lot of judgment calls that have to be made there, and you can systematize that to as much as you can. But ultimately, you are relying on that person to bring back their report and information and their gut feeling about what happened there. So you do have to have a lot of trust in this individual that you're putting out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, and them being pet sitters already, um, they know the kinds of, you know, things that they can run into pet sitting, um, you know, questions or, or small issues or something like that. So, you know, they already have a working knowledge of what the job is like. So whether or not this client is a good fit for us. But we generally have already determined that when we're having that phone call, that initial phone call. Yeah. I, w I was curious, you know, these multiple steps, kind of what's your rate of from initial contact to meet and greet and booked service? Like, do you, do you know, do you know, like for every 10 that call, I, you know, we weed out fives before they actually become clients or anything like that? I would say the the phone calls, I'd say it's 80, 85% become clients and book with us. Wow. Yeah. Occasionally we'll get, we will get people that, um, are out of our service area. You know, occasionally we get that. Mm. But of the people that are actually people that we can service, yeah, I would definitely say probably 80% or higher. Now, you you also have staff members doing administrative work for you. Is that is that uh, also the, the two that are doing the sits or, or do you have somebody dedicated for that kind of work in your business? Um, well, one of the uh, one of the girls who does meet and greets also does some admin work, and then I have another pet sitter, and she does pet sitting as well as about twelve hours in the office every week doing mm -hmm. admin work in addition to pet sitting. Now, both of these girls um, do the scheduling among other tasks as well, um, so they do all the scheduling. And I'll tell you, it is so wonderful to not have to do that because that is a time consuming bear. You know? <laughs> and, um, but because of this, there's, you know, some little perks they get too. I mean, they can basically pick their visits, you know, because we assign visits. We do not let the sitters pick their visits, but these two, um, you know, can pick visits if they see something they really want that they can pick them. And they can, you know, decide not to do other visits, you know, unless we're really, you know, in a in a jam and we're just super busy that, you know, everybody's being a little overworked that week, you know. Well, and so is that again, did you um you know, for for somebody who's sitting here going, I am overwhelmed with this work. Maybe I don't want to hire, uh, uh, you know, an assistant on an online assistant or a remote assistant or something like that. I'd rather have somebody in house. 
how'd you go about selecting them for those tasks? Because here's yet again, here's more control over your business. I mean, you're giving them passwords to things, I presume, in order to get this stuff done. So how did you go about that? Well, I knew them pretty well, you know, as pet sitters um, before, I, you know, I have a lot of contact with my staff, mostly via text mm-hmm. um, because they're updating. We run things a lot differently than a lot of pet sitting uh, companies do. We we're not using journals. <clears throat> we're actually sending our updates, our little videos that we text the customers. And as we've gotten bigger, this is kind of um it is a big hassle, but, you know, down the road, there'll be some changes. But um, so I, the customers get a feeling for who these people are, even though they're not on camera, um, because they're saying, you know, Sparky peed and he pooped and I changed the water and I, I fed and he ate good and, you know, all that stuff and trying to, um, you know, make not everything so boring, you know, sometimes maybe getting something cute in there as you're filming the animal. And, um, but that gives me an idea of who they are as well, Mm. you know, and, um, every week they come to the office to get their checks and keys for the week. So, you know, I, I see these people, it's, you know, it's not, so I get to know them and, you know, the people who stand out to me again is having the confidence and the intelligence is how I choose someone to be an admin. Hmm. Because you know, and and then there's the aspect of you know picking them to do the work, training to do the work, then holding them accountable. Because that's another thing. Of did you did you sit and create d- deadlines, or how did you talk about expectations for scheduling of like when that's required to get done and everything? Yeah, well, I definitely I had to train the first one, um, and <clears throat> since then I'm on my third admin, and now I've got a second admin as well. Um, so. I created SOPs, you know, because I was doing the work myself. And so I created SOPs and trained them myself on how to do this. And there are deadlines involved. And as far as the one admin, you know, she's sitting at the table and I'm usually, my office is my dining room. You know, us pet sitters are lucky enough to work at home usually. And um, her 12 hours a week is I'm sitting right here with her. So we're, you know, we're very close. We get along and we enjoy each other's company. And, um, you know, um, as far as if she's missing a deadline, which does happen, I'll remind her, mm-hmm. you know, hey, I need this done. So, and, and she's also now in charge of all the hiring. So that's wonderful to have that off my plate as well. <laughs> so she does a lot of stuff. She, she really does a lot of stuff in the scheduling what I did a few months ago, because that is such a bear of a job, is I cut it in half. So one of them does the scheduling for the first half of the month. And then the second half of the month is handled by the other one. Mm. So if it's your half of the month and visits are requested, um, you need to get them assigned and you know put on the schedule and tweak the schedule so that the visits make sense, You know, assign them to the sitter's. And, um, and so you're got pretty much the half of the month you're doing it and the other half you're not. Although even if it's not your half of the month, you need to keep tweaking your half of the month, you know, and making sure those visits make sense. Yeah. And, 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 and refining it, right. Cause it is kind of a continual process because there's last minute cancellations. There's all sorts of stuff that are last minute bookings that may come up. And so it's really something that's never done until it's done. Right. <laughs> right. right, but, right. But just, we call know. it a, we call it a living, breathing puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that can be very angry sometimes. I know. Um <laughs> <laughs> Our friends at Pet Perennials make it easy to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct-to-consumer gift model that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches our client or employee on our behalf. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across both the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get-well wishes, and welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. 
If you're interested, register for a free business gift perks account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as-need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchases. Learn more at petperennials.com, check out their business programs, or register for that free gift perks account by using the link in the show notes. You know, you've had this individual who you've you've gave a little bit of responsibility, and they're giving a little bit more responsibility, and they're giving even more responsibility. Was that a conversation that you had with them, uh, or how did you approach them by giving them now more more of that responsibility? Unlike any job, really would it says, okay, now you know I'd like you to take on this, yeah. you know, and then I train them. Um, I usually have an SOP that I write, you know, depending on the task, like I. I don't really have a hiring SOP, but, um, you know, I just, um, let her know that you're going to be doing this and I train them and, um, you know, monitor their progress. And we talk, I mean, we're sitting across the table from each other 12 hours a week. So there's plenty <laughs> of time for communication. That monitoring is key. Many of us may go, okay, well, I'm going to tell them to do this and I'm going to disappear and I'm going to come back. Right. And that's, it's like, no, like you've got to stay in touch with staff members like we do that when we're training with um anything in in our business and and even more so with some of this more administrative work that's not necessarily visit specific where it's not timed where you don't have the notes where you don't have these updates to 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 really check in on and go hey i noticed you didn't do this but going you know the, it's a little bit more I, I feel like it's a little bit more nuanced and takes a little bit more hands-on approach to to monitoring that kind of work that they're doing yeah, one of my problems is I'm a bit of a control freak. So sometimes I just have to like, okay, don't ask her about that again, you know, <laughs> or, you know, learning to, you know, to turn this stuff over to someone else. I think we all struggle with that. Mm. Um, you know, even the people who are just getting other people to do visits and it's like, no one's going to do it as good as me. You know, it's terrifying to turn stuff over to someone else. You know, it's our baby, you know, and to to let it go and to trust, you know, I've struggled with that, to trust that she's doing it or that she's doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> Especially right across the table, I would be tempted to be kind of looking over the shoulder, looking at the work, making sure, you know, <laughs> that's just how I I am. But it it, it is to go, go I, I put everything in place. They watched me do it. We did the training. I, I do, I have to step back at this point. I, I have to do that. Yeah, and it's difficult, but I, I force myself. <laughs> I force myself because, you know, I also worked in corporate America and I was, um, most of my career, I did not have, uh, I was not micromanaged. And I just think, boy, would I want to work for me? You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm kind and I'm nice and I'm respectful and I'm very, I, I feel that I'm a really good trainer, but. Would I want to work for me being like, did you get that done? Did you do this? Did you do that yet? You know? <laughs> so I, I try not to do that, but I know I'm guilty of it. Well, yeah, we have to, it starts with knowing ourselves and not just how we want to communicate, but how we want to be communicated to and kind of what some of our edge cases or some of our triggers are that are going to you know elevate and, and maybe preemptively talking to staff about that. Like, hey, when I'm stressed, I get a little you know, hand, you know, a, a little, a little um, oversighty, right. Of what you're doing. So don't take offense. It's just, I, I'm, I know that. It's about just myself. me. Well, yeah, it's, it's just me. me. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> it, Kelly, you mentioned that you have a, have them working for you for, for 12 hours a week on that. How did you arrive at that number? Well, there were certain tasks I wanted her to do. And then, then when my very first supervisor, who is the, the person who also does the admin work, that's their title. Um, <clears throat> At the very first time I had a supervisor years ago, I kind of didn't know what I needed them to do or when I wanted them to work. And I quickly was like, I got to make a decision because it's not fair for them not to have regular hours. Who wants to work like that? So um, she works um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And that's because there's certain things that need to be done on those days. And so and tasks that I have given her that, you know, need to be done on those days and basically noon to four is when she's working. And it's based on, you know, the need. And um, she also, you know, because she's in charge of scheduling, you know, that's not something that you can just do here and there. 
You know, it needs to be done. We have a 48 hour deadline. Once a customer requests a visit, I want those that, that customer assigned and the confirmations and everything sent within 48 hours. Cause I don't want my customers sitting around wondering if, oh God, did they get that booking? Are they going to be able to handle it? Mm-hmm. You know, so um, that being said, she also needs to work at home sometimes, mm-hmm. not a lot. And she's compensated for, you know, every week she gets a certain amount of pay, you know, that covers her working from home, you know, in some weeks she might have to barely work at home at all. And other weeks she might have to work at home more, but that pay is there every week. Coming up at that time, because many of us may go, well, man, I really need help and I want to be consistent, but I don't even know how much I could afford or what that would look like because that now we're into this territory of, well, it's required work, but it's non-revenue generating work because it's it's easier for us to figure out like, okay, I do one dog walk, I make X money because they generated X money, but scheduling, geez, like how do I even start to approach that? For me, it was a leap of faith, honestly. Mm. I was just like, you know, and I read all the Facebook places, especially back then, you know, all the various groups and stuff. And it was like, I can't go on like this. I just can't be putting in this many hours. I need help. You know, and you get, if you're overworked and overwhelmed, you begin to hate your business. And it's like, I just, I can't go down that road. So it's not going to cost that much money, you know, to have somebody come in for a few hours a week. And I know that we've got enough business to warrant that. Um, That's maybe some people have a better approach than I did, Um, but it's worked for me. But initially, yeah, it was just a leap of faith and a necessity. You know, I was like, you know, kind of build it and they will come. And they did, you know, (laughs) so. (laughs) Well, you said it was a necessity and it sounds like it was a necessity for you, right? Of going like, I can't keep doing this. And then the decision goes, how much would I pay to make this problem kind of go away? Right? It's exactly. really And going, what's it worth to me? And sometimes it's, it, you can't really, I mean, you, you can drill down and find the dollars to minute ratio and all that stuff. But the other sense, it's like, what's my peace of mind worth? Like, what's some space, what's some breathing room back in my day worth? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um you know, I just, um, it, it was definitely, like you said, peace of mind. And, you know, and that was hard for me to let go of too. I was always looking at the schedule to make sure it was right and correcting stuff. And I've eventually just gotten over that. You know, I don't peruse the schedule much anymore at all because I'm paying people to do that. Yeah. You know, so, and they know what they're doing. They've been well-trained and they've been doing it quite a while now. You know, you've been building up these positions as they are, you know, around sp- certain people. Do you have an, a, an eye for full time management or management positions in the future? Maybe far down the road. I don't feel it's something that I can afford at this time. Um, so, no, I'm not looking at that now. Um, I'm actually, you know, sometimes thinking, well, maybe. Um, my supervisor should come, you know, work a few more hours during the week because now that she's got hiring, you know, she's getting a little bogged down. Um, but full time, no, I don't think we're there. I don't think I can afford to do that. You know, and one of the things is when I did take that leap of faith to get some office help, and I knew that, you know, I'm going to make more money if I do all this myself, if I don't pay people to do this. And you can go, you know, with the very thing of doing visits. You're going to make more money if you do it all yourself. But how long can you keep that up? And how happy are you going to be? So, yeah, I'd be making a lot more money if I didn't have other people doing these things. But I can't do it all, and nor do I want to. You know, so that's that's something that was difficult for me in the beginning. You know, the, oh, I don't know if I can afford it. And nobody's going to do it as good as me and I'm not going to trust them. I think we all struggle with that when you first start doing that. But one of the things that pushed me to actually hiring was that I came to the realization that eventually I was going to have too much business that I would not be able to handle. And so I would be turning people away. So those people I turn away are probably going to find another pet sitter and they probably will never come back. So it would always be a revolving door of customers if I couldn't, you know, handle whenever they needed me. So that pushed me to hiring, you know, 
uh, pet sitters is that realization. Yeah, not wanting, I mean, that not wanting to say no, but this, re, that, that idea of this revolving door of people coming in and leaving, you coming and leaving and just going, I don't <clears throat> want them to, to, to leave. Right. And, and some people don't have that desire and that's totally fine. Some people go, no, I, I want my core clients. Uh, this is how I want to operate. But if you have that idea of, well, I would just rather be able to take them on. Now you start saying yes to things like hiring SOPs structures, administrative work. That's required in order for you to make that goal. And, and you know, that's for you, us to decide how we, how we make that work. Yeah, because I didn't, I felt like I would probably be in a customer battle constantly, you know, um, I, you know, always like, God, I need more customers because nobody's booking. You know, if I turn people away, they probably aren't going to come back, you know, unless they have a bad experience with the the next people they hired, you know, but but I didn't want to take those chances, you know. <laughs> no, and you, and you don't wish that on another client, right? You don't go, well, hopefully you'll be back because you have a no. terrible experience, right? You mm-hmm. want them to be well cared for. Oh, definitely. Yes. Kelly, when you think about, you, you talk about, you know, kind of down the road here, what do you see as your next five, 10 year plans as a business? Well, I hope to actually in five years or, you know, thereabouts, to have full-time admin staff so I can step away more and more. I'd like to be have someone else running my business and me sitting on the beach. <laughs> more and more. I'm certain I'm certain I would be on the beach every day, but you know, sure. more and more being able to step away from it and you know, having the confidence that my team can handle things while I'm away. And I'm working, you know, working more and more toward that. But in, you know, five years, yeah, I would like to have somebody else actually running it. Is that what you started to end with, right? When, when you when you started several all those years ago, did you have that in mind of of, of a team? No, running I did. I no, no. I just wanted to take care of pets, and I was like hoping that I could make enough money so I didn't have to go back to corporate America. That was my <laughs> my only goal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it grew. It started as an experiment, and it just grew and grew. I mean, not by accident. Believe me, I've put in a lot of work into this, you know. And I mean, I started it from the ground up. I had to figure out policies and contracts, and you know, all of that stuff. I hadn't, you know, I had nothing, you know. So, like most pet sitters, I believe they're building their baby from the ground up. So, no, I had no exit plan. I. Just was a struggle constantly getting to each new little step and getting the courage to make that next step, you know, hiring a pet sitter, you know, and sharing the visits with somebody else and then hiring another pet sitter, hiring someone to do, you know, having one of my pet sitters learn scheduling, you know, it's just, you know, one for me, one courageous step after the next. (laughs) I love how you put that because in every at every stage of business, I mean, we have that brief moment where we go, "Wow, what else could there possibly be?" Or like, "Man, this is amazing!" <laughs> you laugh. Right? <laughs> it's funny because just the other day I was talking to my best friend, and um, I was telling her that you know a lot of times I get down on myself, thinking, you know, "Oh, I got so much more to do." I got. So one day I wrote a list of all the things I have done over the years and all of the big projects still yet to come. And the, the one side of the list with everything I had gotten through was so much bigger, longer, and it made me feel so much better. And she said, she's very wise. She said, yeah, sometimes when we're closing, you know, climbing a mountain, we forget to look down and see how far we've come. We're just looking at the top and see how far we are away. And I was like, that's an awesome way to put it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and then with each step, as you're, as you're climbing, as you're building your business, each step can become, like you said, it, it's another courageous step to go that much higher, that much further from where you started, that much more into t- to places where you've never been before. And maybe you, you don't know, and you, you try and educate yourself and continue to learn and be connected to good groups and people and resources. But at the end of the day, it's up to us to make that step. And that's, that's now where you go, like that it's a courageous step, every, every step of the way. And we, we forget that of how many previous courageous steps that we, that we took to get to where we are. Yeah. I mean, I encourage you if you're struggling, like I have, I do sometimes, um, you know, those of you who are listening to, to make that list, 
you know, okay, I know I still got to do this. This is a big task I need to do. And this is, you know, another task I need to do. And these are hard, whether it's, you know, some additional software or, you know, having someone else in charge of your hiring or just hiring in general, if you're, you know, haven't done that yet, um, you know, make that list of things you've already done. It will make you feel really good. <laughs> you know, right. one of the big things I had to do way back when was to convert my employees to um, my ICs to employees. That was terrifying. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> that's that's huge. What what made you finally make that switch? Facebook groups, learning oh. about it. I mean, you, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. And I didn't know, you know, when I started my business, because I was doing it on my own for like six months before I hired somebody. Okay. I didn't know. And then I already had these people on as ICs because how the heck do I pay taxes? I don't know how to do pay taxes on employees. I don't know any <laughs> of this stuff, you know. <laughs> and then I started hearing all the controversy surrounding it. And I just was like, I'm not a risk taker. I'm making um, this move, you know. Which changes your business, which changes how you use people, which changes your policies, your procedures, your pricing. Like that's such a massive part of your business. But to go, you know, it's at we reach those stages where we go, in order to do this, I have to make this big step. It's going to be painful. I don't really want to do it, but I I feel like there's no other option and I must do this to 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 make it to what I want it to be to be and continue oh. to move towards that goal. And definitely don't forget that I'm a control freak. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, having people out there that I'm not supposed to train and, you know, all of that. It was terrifying. It's hard enough to find people, but I'm supposed to find people who who have a business and know how to get an EIN number and, you know, all of that stuff and know how to do this. And I can't, you know, train them. And, oh, no, that's not me. So I know that I was not using my ICs properly. And I know that there's pet sitting businesses out there that do. And that's fabulous. Hmm. Use them correctly, you know, but I know I wasn't. Kelly, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and sharing how you've grown your business, how you've taken those courageous steps, and you've encouraged us to continue to do that as well. I know there's a lot that we touched on, uh, and there's a lot more uh, that people we could dive into. So if people are interested in getting connected and following along with all of your work, how can they do that? Um, I guess the best way would be my uh, Facebook business page of Kelly's Critters and my website is kcritters.com. I love that website. It's so so I it's so nice and short and it's it's just it's very nice. I love that web address. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, Kelly's Critters, now the reason I don't have Kelly's Critters.com is because the domain name was really expensive. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always those trade offs in business, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, we'll just do K Critters. I think this will work. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll have links to those in the show notes uh, so people can click right to those. Uh, Kelly, this has just been ab absolutely thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for having me. How are you providing a touch of that no like, and trust factor with your potential clients and your onboarding clients? At what stage of the process do they build that with you and for your business and company? Are you equipping your team to provide that as well? Do they have the tools, resources, knowledge, and experience to provide that to those clients who are coming on board? A well-thought-out new client onboarding process will do so much for your business. It will build that trust. It will build that confidence in your clients. It will educate them about your business. And you will be fully aware of the client expectations on you and your business. We often think about the pet care exclusively. But we have to get our clients to that point. And so we set the expectations of what those visits will look like and what our business actually does through our onboarding process. We want to thank today's sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials, for making today's show possible. And thank you so, so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll be back again soon. <laughs>